Ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. On this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we learn more about the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, its goals, and the cattlemen that help guide our industry. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxner. Thanks for joining us. It's an idea that's endured more than 110 years, that cattlemen and women can work together to defend the industry's way of life and promote our products. The National Livestock Growers Association was established back in January of 1898, and through three mergers, some organizational splits, and many other challenges, the concept has survived. It now exists in its current form as the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Let's learn more about who NCBA really is. NCBA is truly the organization that represents grassroots cattlemen that can't get off the ranch to go to Washington, D.C. We represent their interests in Washington. We also manage contracts. We have the beef checkoff program that uh, help build beef demand and, protect, and also protect the image of beef uh, to the consuming public. The goal of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association? To be the trusted leader and the definitive voice in today's beef industry and beyond. The group does so in two ways. First, as a contractor to the Beef Checkoff and implementing the programs those dollars fund. The Beef Checkoff program is a very vital program for the U.S. beef industry to be sustainable for the next several decades. The Beef Checkoff program allows NCBA as a contractor to that program to not only produce the results through research, through innovation, through issues management, but also through marketing our product to consumers, again, not only just here in the U.S., but consumers all around the globe. So it enables us to cut through all the clutter that comes before a consumer each and every day in a more meaningful way so that they have beef as the source of protein. And beef is not only what's for dinner, but it is the source of protein for consumers around the world. NCBA also works to represent the interests of cattlemen in Washington, D.C. It's the goal of the policy division to preserve cattlemen's way of life and work to keep our industry profitable. Now, it's critical that NCBA have a full-time staff here in Washington, D.C. A staff that's working the Hill, a staff that's working the administration, making sure that we're developing the relationships with folks like the U.S. Trade Representative, like the members of the House and the Senate, so they understand what the concerns are in the countryside. Our producers have a lot going on day in, day out, and they don't always have the time to contact their member of Congress. So they need somebody who can do that on their behalf, and that's what NCBA staff does. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association believes the best way for our industry to continue growing and build demand for beef is by working together. NCBA is very important to the beef industry from the standpoint that if you look at everything that we do at NCBA, we have a research program, we have promotion programs, we have marketing programs, uh, we have a very, very strong government office in, in D.C. NCBA, through the policy that we implement in Washington, D.C., and the checkoff programs that we contract for with the operating committee, is able to do things collectively that individual cattlemen can't do. For example, we're able to win issues in Washington, D.C., working together collectively. We're able to develop new products with beef checkoff dollars, and that's something that individual cattlemen can't do. But if you collectively work on these things, that's a win-win for everyone. The leaders at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association say they're proud and humbled to represent America's cattlemen and women. The one thing cattlemen should know about NCBA is that we are the oldest, largest national organization representing you as beef producers each and every day so that you can be back home at your operations and not having to worry about, number one, am I going to have a product to sell next year or am I going to have a business environment that I have freedom to operate within so that I can not only be successful but profitable but also sustainable in a way that I can pass my operation on to the next generation. NCBA represents the core beef producers in this country and connects them with other segments of the beef supply chain each and every day. 
Reporting from Denver and Washington, D.C., I'm Gary Hansbro for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association is directed by its producer leadership. Each year, cattlemen representing different segments of the industry and different parts of the country are elected to help guide the association. And joining me in our studio is that group. Bill Donald is a Montana cattleman and president of NCBA. J.D. Alexander comes to us from Nebraska where he operates a feed yard and is the president-elect of the association. And Scott George comes to us from Wyoming as a dairy producer. Gentlemen, thanks for coming to the show. Good to be here. Good. Well, let's begin with a similar question to all three of you. I'll start with you, Bill. Why are you an NCBA member? Give us a little bit about that background. Well, I originally got involved with some issues in Montana and through uh, the Montana Stock Growers Association, which is the NCBA affiliate. Mm. And when I got into that organization, I, I got interested in all the different issues that impact cattlemen across the state. And I got into leadership. And when I got into the officer rotation of Montana Stock Growers, that put me on the board of NCBA, where I was uh, exposed to all the issues all over the country. And I found that fascinating and thought that maybe I should give something back to the industry from which I derive my living. So I volunteered to be in the leadership of NCBA. JD, what about you? What uh, brought you to NCBA? Well, very similar situation. I think everybody in the cattle business gets started on their local level. And uh, that usually leads to something else. Uh, once I became uh, into the local level, I got to be on the uh, executive committee of the Nebraska Cattlemen. Eventually worked my way up to uh, be president. And normally when you get into those positions, you also get a position on the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. And that really got us involved, uh, went to a lot of meetings, you know, get into items that you're really interested in. And it just, uh, you, it's uh, kind of the staying factor. Uh, you're very involved, very interested, and uh, things get more and more uh, enlightened. And you want to be a part of it, of something good like NCBA, so uh, uh, the rest is history. Scott, you know, uh, a lot of people think of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association just being about beef cattle. You're a dairy producer. Tell us about your involvement at NCBA and what brought you to the organization. I actually came from a different side of this. Uh, I got involved in the beef promotion end of this uh, business, and as I came in contact with NCBA, I saw how they were also dealing with the political issues, the defending our right to stay in business and defending our right and helping us be profitable in our business. And I found it to be an organization that helps all segments of the industry be profitable, and I like that. And I've been very pleased with this organization, how they look at the issues, find solutions, how they're trying to promote the product that we produce through our consumers and address the issues that they've got concerns about. And so that's why I'm here today. That's great. Bill, let me turn back to you. You've had some recent wins in Washington, D.C. and otherwise. Why don't you tell folks a little bit about some of those key accomplishments? This has been a great year. Uh, NCBA's D.C. team has been absolutely phenomenal on target. You know, after five years, we finally got three free trade agreements passed with South Korea, Panama, and Colombia. Those are huge. They'll put many, many dollars back in producers' pockets. One of the other things about the South Korean Free Trade Agreement is using it for a template for other countries in the Asian Rim. So that's going to put a lot of money in producers' pockets. On the other side of the issues, what we look at is how do we have a freedom to operate? And we were successful in getting the Grain Inspection and Stockyards Administration's proposed rules on cattle marketing pulled out of the gypsy rule. That was, a big, that was a big win for us because it allows us to market our cattle in the way that we see fit without having the government right in the middle of it. Now there was still a competitive injury clause in that that wasn't removed, it was just postponed. But we were able to remove the funding from the appropriations bill, so we have got until next September to see if we can't get a permanent fix in for that. As far as the rules on dust, Administrator Jackson from the EPA has pulled the rule regulating farm dust. That is a huge win for us, so we have five years to come up with a statutory fix on that level. And if we look at the other side with some of the promotional work we do with the checkoff, we've produced a document called the Cattlemen Stewardship Review, which really defines who cattlemen are. It's time that we decided we defined who we are rather than have other groups define it for us. And so that's a great document, a great resource that people can find on explorebeef.org. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it's good for uh, in schools or libraries or wherever you need to educate consumers. And we did all of that and put 
$2 million in reserve. So we are financially strong for the long haul, and it's going to be a, a great win for us. That's great. Great accomplishments. J.D., I know you're not the type of guy to rest on our laurels, so what are some of your priorities as you look forward into 2012? It has been a great year. I've, I've got to uh, echo what Bill said. It's been a great year, and, and we don't. We don't rest on our laurels. We're always looking to the future. You know, we're going to continue to look at trade. The thing that I always uh, remember is that we've got 96% of the world's population outside the United States, mm -hmm. and uh, it, there's a lot of mouths to feed. Uh, their level of living is getting higher. Uh, once you do that, they want uh, a better standard of a meal, mm -hmm. uh, more protein, and we want uh, beef to be the center of the plate. So we're going to continue to look at trade. You know, another issue that uh, we've got to look at next year is uh, coming around and looking at the estate tax again. You know, we put that to rest a couple years ago uh, in 2012. It resurfaces. Uh, we're going to have to address that because it goes back to, I think the number is a million dollar exemption. And then anything above and beyond that is taxed at 55 percent. Uh, that's devastating to our producers. Uh, you know, we're all about moving our business to the next generation. Uh, with those type of taxes, that's next to impossible. Yeah. One of my favorite sayings is, uh, if you're not at the table, uh, you're on the menu. <laughs> and, and I think the thing that we've got to remember there is, is NCBA looks at all issues. Yeah. We don't just uh, pick the ones we think we can win. Uh, and and fight on, but we look at all issues, and uh, there's none that are basically exempt for us us from looking at. So uh, we're looking forward to a lot of things. We're going to have our, uh, our 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 boots on the hill is definitely going to be active. Yeah. Well, Scott, I'd like you to look forward uh, in, into the future and, and and tell us what do you see five years from now for this association. I wish I had my crystal ball here. <laughs> in five years, we would, we would like to see our membership up to about 40,000 members. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to continue to see the organization remain the strong organization advocating for producers uh, in the political realm. We'd also like to see more checkoff money, quite honestly. We are a contractor for the checkoff, and we do a lot of work for all cattle producers, whether they're NCBA members or not. And we'd like to see that money come up so that we could continue to do better work for that. Uh, we, we've got to continue on where we are. We've got to continue on build on these strengths and wins that we've already had and continue to face the issues that arise. Very good. So, Bill, if we're going to get to that 40,000 uh, members, why do you think people should become a member of this organization if they're not already? Well, all cattlemen should be a member of National Cattlemen's Beef Association because NCBA works on all issues for cattlemen. Mm -hmm. And we want to be a servant to the industry. We're not a master of it, we're a servant for it. And we can do that much more effectively the more input we have from all cattlemen. So I think every cattleman should join. We need the numbers to have political clout, but we need their ideas as well. And through that, we can have a team that will be the trusted uh, voice of the cattle industry. J.D., I wanted to ask you a question. There are a lot of diverse perspectives in, in our industry and a lot of people who, who think differently on a number of different topics. How does NCBA try to find common ground among those various uh, cattlemen and, and, and what is the role in, in, in forming policy once you've found that common ground? The thing that we really stress is we're a grassroots organization and a lot of the things that we look at and debate and talk about amongst ourselves is things that are developed at the local level. It could be an individual producer out there that has an issue that thinks uh, we can help him on. Uh, usually he goes to their state and the state then debates it, talks about it to see if it is legitimate or not. Uh, then a lot of times the state will bring it forward and we have our national meetings, we get together with all the states, uh, then they'll discuss it. I call it kind of a check and balance system. You know, it might be right for one state, but not necessarily for another. Uh, it might be right for a region and not another. But, but it is. It's, it's discussion. It's hall talk. It's debate. And it's voted on. Uh, we're, a, we're a democratic organization where, you know, if somebody has something and it's a good, good idea, it'll be discussed, talked about, voted on, either up or down. And if it does uh, get voted in, it becomes our policy. And then that's our driving force of how we direct our staff to go ahead and, and uh, talk about the issue to the, the politicians or whoever need be as far as getting it accomplished. Scott, uh, if people are watching this and, and you know, intrigued about the possibility of becoming a member, uh, what's the one thing you'd want them to know? I would want them to know that NCBA is working to keep them profitable in their cattle business. 
And that gives them the opportunity to pass it on to future generations, to stay in business, to be sustainable. Uh, profit is the answer to keeping us in the cattle business, and, and that's what NCBA is working for on all these different fronts. Well, I know you all are taking a lot of time away from your own operations to serve in this capacity of leadership, and let me tell you, as one cattleman to another, we appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. We appreciate that. Join these cattlemen as members of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. To do so, call us at 1-866-USA-BEEF or visit us at beefusa.org. Next on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. The, the beef industry, as I've been able to see it, as I've been exposed to the different aspects of it, it's very resilient, it's, uh, it's vibrant, the folks that are in it really, really like what they do and they're very professional and, um, and painstakingly careful about how they manage their resources and how they manage their cattle. Well, you know, we've got to promote our product and uh, we've got a great product, we've got a, a very nutritious, healthy product and uh, there's a lot of people out there that would like the public to think otherwise. So we've got to constantly stay on top of that. A day in the lives of two NCBA leaders, a cattleman in Missouri and another in Texas. We'll learn how their experiences have helped them be positive contributors to the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. You're watching NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen on RFD TV. When it comes to versatility on your operation, nothing beats a John Deere D-Series skid steer. They're not only great for cleaning and feed chores, but with John Deere Worksite Pro attachments, you can tackle just about any job thrown your way. You asked for versatility, and John Deere delivered. These rock-solid machines are built to last. See your dealer today. When respiratory diseases hit the herd, it doesn't take long before your calves are drowning in complications. Unless you have them prepared, get them ready with Pyramid 5 plus Presponse SQ. This one easy vaccine will protect your herd from a range of ailments. Hey, there is plenty of fresh air out here. Make sure your calves get their fill. Go on now. Take care of your cattle, and they'll take care of you. Well, I think a rancher has to be a steward of the land. There's nobody else that can take care of land better than a rancher. When we switched over to the uh, Perina products, it was a step in the right direction. The difference we see in the cattle is the consistency of their nutrition. The cattle hold their condition a lot better throughout the whole year. It does make a difference that we can see, day in and day out. Take the 60-day challenge and save up to $55 on Purina feed. Sign up at PurinaDifference.com. Welcome back. It's a part of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association that isn't often well known. The intelligent and hardworking staff that work on behalf of the Beef Checkoff, the Federation of State Beef Councils, and the Policy Division. Let's learn a bit about them and why they choose to work for NCBA. I love working at NCBA in the Federation uh, Services Department because we have a chance to interact with this amazing network of state beef councils from across the country. The Federation is comprised of those 45 state beef councils and our department uh, provides service and interaction with those uh, state staff and state volunteer producers. I like working for NCBA because I love working for and with U.S. cattle producers. I love working for NCBA because I get to work with and represent American cattle producers. I love working for NCBA because I get to work with a lot of great people and I get to sample from the kitchen occasionally. I love working at NCBA because as a producer I get the fortunate experience of being able to see how our checkoff dollars are invested and also being able to be a part of helping to increase beef demand throughout the country for other beef producers out there. I love uh, being able to represent the industry and really uh, feel like we make a difference for this industry that my family's been a part of for so long, uh, for many generations. and. The fact that we have uh, at least a minor contribution to uh, perpetuating the industry into the future. There's just a lot of great things that uh, being in the beef industry allows us to do. It's a way of life uh, and working for America's farmers and ranchers at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association 
through the beef checkoff is, is one of the greatest honors that you can have. I work at NCBA because I truly have a passion for the industry. I grew up on a cattle operation in Texas. Uh, cattle industry has been very good to me. It's been very good to my mom and dad through, through the years. And I look at working at NCBA, it gives me an opportunity uh, to give back to the in industry a lot of the stuff that it gave me through my younger years. One group of that hardworking NCBA team is its membership department. And joining me in the studios is Marvin Kokash, Vice President of Association Marketing, and Kate Maher, the Member Services Director for NCBA. Thanks so much for coming to the show. Thanks, Thanks Kevin. Kevin. Well, Kate, first of all, let's start with you. What does being an NCBA member mean to cattlemen? Kevin, being an NCBA member um, means that cattlemen have eyes, ears, and most importantly, a voice in Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., uh, d dealing with all the issues uh, affecting policy and their operation. And Marvin, I know you grew up in this industry, so, so what would you tell folks about why they should be an NCBA member? You know, I uh, actually had this conversation with my brothers at home this last weekend, and, um, you know, being a fifth generation uh, ranch out there, uh, a couple key issues that really drive uh, in their belief in this organization. Uh, first and foremost is our recent progress on the GYPS issue. Mm -hmm. Another big issue that uh, the NCBA has been working on its members' behalf is in the area of estate taxes. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, really important to the multi-generation ranches like ours. Kate, what's one thing that uh, folks ought to know about being an NCBA member? That it all starts with them. Our grassroots efforts and success depends on our members and every membership counts and every voice matters and it makes us stronger as an industry. Now I understand that there's some really special incentives right now for becoming an NCBA member. Marvin, you want to share a little bit about that? Sure, Kevin. Uh, it's a very exciting time to become an NCBA member. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we've got great corporate partners out there that do uh, some amazing things to, to help support the NCBA membership effort. Um, we have a relationship with John Deere to where uh, we have over 35 products that you get a, a cash rebate on uh, purchase of those products, a fantastic benefit. Mm -hmm. We also have um, an opportunity to save NCBA members 15% on uh, Cabela's gift cards. Um, and as we look uh, during hunting season or during the holiday season, what, what a great time to save a little money and, uh, and uh, shop at a great organization like Cabela's. And uh, last but certainly not least is our new relationship we have with Roper and Stetson. Uh, new members receive a 50% coupon off their entire purchase of Roper and Stetson boots and apparel. And uh, great savings, uh, great organization, great products. And, I think we're uh, all wearing some of those boots today, aren't we? That's right. And, <laughs> you know, and then our existing members also receive, they receive four 25% off coupons over the course of the year. So it's really uh, these member benefits are not only for new members, but also existing members to, to show them that tangible uh, value along with uh, what we do in Washington on their behalf. There's never been a better time to become a member. Thank you so much for coming to the show. Thank Thanks you, Kevin. Kevin. Join the National Cattlemen's Beef Association today and support the future of our industry. Give us a call at 1-866-USA-BEEF or visit us at beefusa.org. We'll be right back. Draxon, clearly Cattlemen's number one choice to fight BRD. Here's why. Nothing is more depressing in a stalker business as to doctor and doctor. And you still have your chronics, you still have your death loss. And with Draxon, we just found out, that, especially with microplasts, you just had to be there to see the results. And the evidence backs up what most cattlemen already know. Draxon cuts chronics and mortalities by 70%. So talk to your veterinarian and check the online calculator at Draxon.com. You'll see, nothing gives you more for your money when you're fighting BRD. Just a great antibiotic. Very, very effective. Don't let the price tag scare you. It's a no-brainer. You just use it. Do not use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older. Do not use in calves to be processed for veal. Draxon has a pre-slaughter withdrawal time of 18 days. Please visit Draxon.com or call 1-888-DRAXON for more information. Welcome back. An essential part of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association is its volunteer leadership. 
They're cattlemen and women just like you who feel passionate about giving back to our great industry. Let's learn more about Bob McCann, Texas cattleman and leader of NCBA's policy division. Well, I'm a, a fifth generation uh, rancher who's ranched this property here in Victoria County, Texas. And uh, my great great grandfather came down here in, in the 1850s and uh, established our ranch about 1877 here uh, at this confluence of the Guadalupe and Santone River. And we've been here ever since. In the pre dawn hours, Bob saddles up at his family's McFadden Enterprises. It's mainly a cow calf operation where they raise commercial purebred Brayford cattle. They're three quarter Hereford, 25% uh, Brahmin influenced. And uh, we, uh, we market, uh, market steers. And also we sell uh, replacement animals, replacement commercial heifers and, and Brayford bulls also that we send all around the country. Growing up in the cattle industry has given Bob a deep respect for the land and its resources. He's won several awards for rangeland management and stewardship. Well, it's, uh, you know, this, this resource that we have is just, uh, they're not making any more of it. And it's going to be sustainable for myself and my family and uh, my children for generations to, to come. It's, uh, we've got to take care of it and we've got to make sure that it's going to be able to support the, uh, the economies of scale, the livestock uh, grazing, as well as our wildlife populations, our white-tailed deer and bobwhite quail that we, uh, we, we get a lot of revenue from also. So uh, that's, that's the main thing. I think it's got to, got to maintain a viable uh, sustainability uh, economically as well as environmentally. Bob's a veteran member of NCBA. He's also chairman of the association's policy division. That group is responsible for developing NCBA's positions on issues that are important for cattle producers. It also drives NCBA's work with lawmakers in Washington, D.C. In his role as chairman, Bob acts as a conduit between the association and the state organizations. If there's a state affiliate that's got a problem, um, you know, that regional VP is going to try to find out what the issue is. And uh, they, they bring that up, uh, up the ladder and, and uh, the officers and the staff will try to figure out how to do a better job there. So I think that's probably uh, what we do best in the policy division side. NCBA, Bob says, provides a wide spectrum of services to producers, including educational outreach, product promotion, and policy work. And those are important tools, he says, for anyone in the beef industry. We've got a very nutritious, healthy product. There's a lot of people out there that would like the public to think otherwise. So we've got to constantly stay on top of that and uh, make sure that the science is there and that the uh, information is, is available to the consumers and, uh, and, and let them know what our story is. Let them know about the cattle producers out in the country. Regionally, Bob and other Texas ranchers are dealing with historic drought. But a big national issue, he says, is the shrinking cattle herd, and he'd like to see those numbers go up. I think everybody is concerned that if we we're not able to accomplish that, that uh, our product price may get just so so uh, high that it's it's not going to be as desirable on the shelf. You know, if it gets too expensive, certainly there's a there's a balance to to find there. And you know we've we've got to make sure that we don't get this herd down to where it's it's uh, it's it's a real problem for the pricing. Uh, we're trying to attract different foreign markets. Uh, we don't want to have to go to those foreign markets and say our beef is going to be the most expensive beef in the world. Certainly, it's the most nutritious, healthiest. Uh, they need to pay for it. But uh, if we don't keep a pretty good balance on this on these populations numbers, it's going to be too expensive and they're going to go somewhere else. By taking advantage of educational opportunities, Bob says today's cattlemen and women are better informed. And he hopes his son and the new generation of producers will be able to continue the work he's known and loved all his life. Well, I've uh, kind of grown up on the ranch and this is really pretty much all I've, I've ever done. And, and uh, so I enjoy it. I enjoy the whole thing. I enjoy uh, cattle production and I enjoy riding and 
and being able to come out and spend time on the properties and uh, see things grow and so it's 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 always a kind of a pleasure for me and uh, to be able to, to have the luxury to be out out in the, in the open spaces. Reporting from McFadden, Texas, I'm Brad Bullock for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. And joining me in the studio are Bob McCann, Chairman of NCBA's Policy Division, and Colin Woodall, Vice President of Government Affairs. Guys, thanks so much for coming to the show. Yeah, thanks for Thank having you, us. Thank you, Kevin. Well, Bob, it was good to get to know just a little bit more about you. Um, tell us why you invest so much of your volunteer time for the NCBA organization. Well, Kevin, I feel like NCBA has, uh, has done a lot for my family operation. Uh, we've benefited a lot from the things that they've done. They've been able to accomplish an association, as an association. And I just feel like uh, it's time for me to give back a little bit. I feel uh, an obligation to, uh, to give some service back to the organization that's, that's uh, done so much for us. Well, we, we thank you for doing that as well. Colin, as you know, Bob leads the policy division, and I guess a lot of folks would be interested to know, how does NCBA set policy? It's a great process because it's truly a grassroots process. Our policy typically originates at a county or state cattlemen's meeting, it then is brought to an NCBA meeting where our policy committees debate the issue, talk about the resolution, can make some changes. Once it's passed, it then goes to our board of directors that has another opportunity to debate, discuss, and pass it. And then finally, the entire membership of NCBA votes on it. And it truly is one man, one vote. We as staff, we don't set policy. Our members set policy, and that drives all of our actions in Washington, D.C. And speaking of that, Bob, members have given you a long list of priorities to work on, but why don't you highlight some of your top priorities? Well, we, we do have a lot uh, of priorities and uh, a lot of different policies that Colin and his crew work on in, in D.C. there, but I guess as far as the policy division, you know, membership is, is a big priority for us, and, and we're kind of in process of getting our membership boosted back up and uh, just getting some good exposure for what NCB, NCBA does for livestock producers out in the country. But uh, of course, uh, GYPSA rule has been a big one for us this year and that was probably one of our top priorities. And uh, you know, Colin and his crew there in Washington did an excellent job and uh, we, we can kind of brag about that one right now. Absolutely. Well, Colin, I'd like to look forward a little bit. What are some of your goals in the coming months? When we look at 2012, there's going to be a lot of things going on. It's an election year, mm -hmm. so not only do we need to continue our efforts to educate the current members of Congress and their staff, but we also have to get a hold of a lot of these candidates for Congress to make sure that they understand what our issues are, and that way they know that when they are elected, uh, that they can come to us to find the guidance on what we need to do to protect farmers and ranchers in this country. And we're going to continue to work to make sure we get some permanent reform to the death tax. We're going to continue to work on the GYPSA issue that Bob talked about, market access, and there's also the outstanding farm bill that we're going to be a very integral part of. Well, I tip my hat to you and your team. You've had some real uphill battles and you've done a phenomenal job. Bob, I, I guess I'd get back to you. Uh, you're very passionate about this organization. Why do you think people should join NCBA? Well, Kevin, I, I think NCBA is probably the best advocacy group uh, available for livestock producers in the country. And uh, we're a very diversified organization. We cover all the gamuts, all the, all the different uh, issues that, uh, that cattlemen are facing, and uh, as well as the beef promotion component of NCBA. We, uh, we have a great relationship with our state affiliates. We are a state national relationship is, uh, is just a great way of melding all the issues and bringing those issues from the ground root, grassroots up um, and uh, getting them up in our nation's capital and, and uh, facing those issues and taking care of them. Um, I th we've got a lot of great programs uh, that we offer, services we offer to our members and uh, for the money I think it's, it's the best value in an ag membership you can get. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for, for what you do every day on behalf of all of us cattlemen across the country. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Join cattlemen like Bob McCann as members of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. To do so, give us a call at 1-866-USA-BEEF or visit us at beefusa.org. We'll be right back.
Seasons change, but year in, year out, year round, it's Crystal X season. With specific supplements for weaning stress in fall. Protein for pre-calving in winter. Calving in spring. And minerals and fly control in summer. For low cost per head per day supplements, every season is Crystal X season. We know who made that hitch. We know who cut the steel, who milled the ball, and who welded the seams. We know who tested, measured, and checked. We even know who thought the whole thing up. We're B&W, and we know your hitch. Because we don't make them halfway around the world. We make them all right here. B&W. Trusted. Welcome back. Cattlemen sometimes seem to have their feet in two worlds, the modern, constantly changing, globalized world, and the one that values our industry's unique history and traditions. Cattlemen to Cattlemen's Brian Baxter reports from Missouri on one industry leader who successfully blends the old and the new. We've been here in this part since uh, 1822 and 24 on land grants. We're still here and we still got cattle and we still enjoy it. David Dick has deep roots in the town of Sedalia, Missouri. His family settled here nearly two centuries ago and began working cattle at about the same time. Additionally, David's been active in the community since he was a teenager. Oh, I do a lot of different things. I'm chairman of Soil and Water District, which is kind of kind of interesting in itself. I've been sexed in a Calvary Cemetery since uh, I think 2002. And uh, that's interesting in itself and in that uh, they asked me to do that primarily because most of those folks that are already there in the cemetery are my ancestors. Uh, the interesting part of that is the genealogy side of it. You get calls from all over the country and we're looking for great aunt or great uncle or great 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 grandpa and are they there and what's it say on the tombstone and that kind of stuff. So you, you get to meet or become acquainted with a lot of people through that aspect of it. He's quite a historian. He's, he, he loves history, uh, going back and finding out about uh, things in the neighborhood or in the county. I don't think a lot of people uh, think that much about their communities. David's day job is the Missouri State Fair, an event that draws about 400,000 people every summer. He's currently the fair's treasurer and holds the dual positions of livestock and beef cattle superintendent. As the general livestock superintendent, I overall I see all 19 livestock departments. Um, that in itself is interesting because, you know, I'm not real familiar with rabbits or llamas. But, uh, you know, knew, knew a little bit about sheep, knew a little bit about uh, some of the other stuff, the hogs, but wasn't really familiar with the rest of it. So that in itself was kind of interesting. Something David knows well is the cattle industry. He's active in his county junior livestock association and extension council. He also chairs the Federation of State Beef Councils, which oversees the reinvestment of state checkoff dollars into national demand driving programs. Missouri, he says, has a long history of supporting the checkoff. Most of the folks here in this state have uh, their herds of cattle are, are less than 20, 25, somewhere in that range. And they've always been interested in making sure that, number one, the marketplace is, is free and open. And then, number two, that their product has a place on the store shelf and that folks want to buy it after it gets there. So it's always been, they understand the business model of it, and I think they understand that the checkoff is a very key part of that business model. David is also hands-on when it comes to his cattle. He and his father run a cow-calf operation. The deal with the cattle is you get to see your genetics perform over time. I mean, you know, like these heifers here, those are decisions that I made probably five or ten years ago as to bulls and what I was looking for on down the road. And, and we've always liked the bigger cattle, and so I guess I just like seeing whether what I see and what I like pans out or not. Wearing all these hats keeps David on the move, traveling constantly and even answering calls from other Federation officers while checking on his herd. But that volunteer spirit has also brought him in contact with people from across the industry and given him a far-reaching perspective. The beef industry, as I've been able to see it, as I've been exposed to the different 
aspects of it. It's very resilient. It's, uh, it's vibrant. The folks that are in it really, really like what they do and they're very professional and, um, and painstakingly careful about how they manage their resources and how they manage their cattle. I mean, it's, uh, both things are kind of integral to them making a profit and if they don't protect both things, then they aren't going to be in business for very long. David is also concerned about the amount of capital it now takes to start a cattle operation, as well as the financial challenges facing the next generation. It used to be pretty easy to get into the cattle deal, pretty easy to get in, pretty easy to get out. And uh, I'd say now it's probably not nearly easy enough to get into. It's still easy to get out of, but I'd say probably that's the biggest change. The age, you know, we're beginning to age. Uh, the folks that are involved in this business, so it's probably the fact that we need to be mindful about getting the young folks started and how you do that, and that's actually a, a dollars and cents capital issue. And David thinks it's important for producers to remember that they are in the food business, a fact that is sometimes overlooked. It's all about the cattle and how many head and how many dollars and cents, but ultimately we're in the meat business. And when you're in the food business, that's kind of a position of trust, and you need to remember that, that you have this trust and we do have a good trust with our consumer, but I think we just need to remember that we're in the meat business more than we are the cattle business. David is working to make sure his community and the cattle industry continue to thrive. And he says it's been fun watching people he's known since childhood come into the industry. There's always a surprise in that to kids that usually sometimes don't ever act like they were interested in that, that calf or that pig or that lamb wind up being really interested in it you know, after they get married and have kids of their own, which is always kind of fun to watch that, that second and almost sometimes third generation now come back into the process that I went through when I was a kid. And I do that primarily because somebody did it when I was a kid. And so it's kind of given back. Reporting from Sedalia, Missouri, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. And joining me in the studio is Federation Chairman David Dick and Chef Shanoa French. Thank you so much for both coming to the show. Thank Glad you. to be here. Shanoa, I hope this isn't what you call too many cooks in the kitchen here today. You will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get started on our great recipe, David, I want to talk to you just a moment. Tell us a little bit about the Federation itself. Well, the Federation is the state 50 cents of the dollar. The state's collected 50 cents, goes to the Cattlemen's Beef Board, and 50 cents stays at home in the states. There are 45 qualified state beef councils, and that's what makes up the Federation. Very good. And how does the Federation get involved in projects emanating from the Culinary Innovation Center? Well, there are a lot of things that that 50 cents can do, and through the Federation, we do a lot of recipe research, mm -hmm. which is part of new product development, and uh, we get things that uh, Shanoa brings to us that are easy to do at home and tasty just the same. Absolutely, and it looks like she's already started. Shanoa, tell us what we're cooking today. Well, today we're going to do uh, a different take on your traditional pot roast. Okay. So this is called the Southwest Beef Pot Roast, and um, what I have is a usually a three to four pound bottom round. All right. So this is one of our lean cuts that we've used, and I've started rubbing a little bit of cumin. Um, you mm -hmm. can use fresh ground cumin or you can buy it at the grocery store and just about two teaspoons, rub it all over the roast. <laughs> so okay. it gives you just a nice flavor. Sure. Over here you have a nice big stock pot. I've yeah. added a little bit of oil and you heat it up. And what we're going to do is the importance of that heated oil is we're going to get a nice sear, mm -hmm. which will help impart the flavor when we do some braising, which is what this recipe requires. So, gotcha. and, and you would even do this in a, in a uh, cock, crock pot kind of a you situation? You could do this recipe in a crock pot, but we would recommend that you sear and you brown first, first and then go ahead and, and throw it in the crock okay. pot. Um, crock pot is if you're going to want to start in the morning and let it run all day. Gotcha. In here you can do it in about two and a half to three hours. Um, on the stove top. Sure. So a little bit of oil. Um, as you see, I've rubbed a little cumin on there. I'm going to add a little bit of salt and pepper yeah. to the same top and season it as you you wish. They call sure. for about a half a teaspoon. I'm going to start, this had a little bit of fat cap, so sure. I'm going to start with that down All right. um, just to kind of render that some of that off. So Very you good. get a nice dog, sear yeah. on there. Um, medium heat. Add just a list of those little sprinkles That's on here. Standard. And yeah. what this does is you just kind of let it brown on all sides. So hot pan, you'll hear a little see, see, mm -hmm. um, the sizzle, let it wait until it releases, and then you'll go ahead and flip it and move it around 
all sides. Very good. So I'm gonna let this go. This recipe is a really quick and easy um, That's recipe. good, quick and easy, yeah, we so like we that. Thought that. Anybody could do this at home. Well, that's what our consumer research tells us too, yeah. that it has to be quick and easy. Yeah, this one's not under the 30 minutes, but, but it's less than 30 minutes prep time for sure. sure. Right. So this is two cups of salsa. Mm -hmm. Pick your favorite kind. Right. right now they're doing a lot with chipotle salsa sure. or a green salsa verde, right. whatever you like. Yep. Um, and then it'll be two cups. As soon as we get this all browned, uh -huh. I'm going to go ahead and flip this to the good. other side. Um, you'll add the whole the salsa in there okay. mm -hmm. and go ahead and put a lid on it. Uh -huh. So, And your, your salsa will come to a little bit of a boil, which is what you want, and that's simmering. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to add a lid to it, turn the heat down to like medium at the highest. You don't want to make, you want to make sure that when you put your lid on there and you're going to cook it for about two and a half hours, yeah. that you don't run out of water because okay. that's the braising right. process. Um, if you need to add a little bit of water back in, um, you can do that, but you'll put a lid on tight um, and then you let it simmer until it's fork tender. And, and that's the, the term that we use for end doneness mm -hmm. with any braised product. Um, a lot of times when we're cooking steaks, we talk about medium rare is 145 or, right. or that, and we don't have a degree of doneness for braising, it's just fork tender. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hey, it's looking this guy good. out. Yeah. Looking good. So get a little bit of flavor. And you said probably about three hours or thereabouts. Two and a half to three hours, kind good. of depending on, on altitude and the heat. Right. You'll add this in there, you'll see that you get some good sizzling, so you'll bring the salsa up to okay. a little bit of a boil. It's a little different than the old carrots and potatoes in a hot yeah, roast, yeah, isn't yeah. it, David? Onions too. <laughs> Onions too. So spin that around. It's boiling. You just put the lid on, and I'd turn it down, like I said, to that right. low medium heat, and you let it cook. All right. Um, once it's fork tender, you're gonna pull your meat out. Yep. And then go ahead and add. Oh, some it's black a, beans. A can of black beans. Right, good. Go ahead and drain them and rinse them. Yeah. And then. Um, a cup and a half of corn. Fantastic. And this can be frozen corn. Um, if you want to use canned corn, just make sure you drain it and rinse it. Awesome. This just gets added at the end and it gets all mixed together till it's hot. And then you pull it out and um, go ahead and slice it up. Look at this. And oh, then this David, be now a, that looks good. That yeah. does look good. We've yeah. served it over here. This side has a little bit of brown rice. On, right. the, on the right over there is a little white rice. So you can kind of depend whatever the family wants and some corn chips. Well, David, I don't know if that's uh, Southwest Missouri, but it's certainly a Southwest recipe and it looks delicious. Now, you can get details on this recipe and other great beef dishes on our website at cattlemantocattlemen.org. The man that leads the National Cattlemen's Beef Association grew up on a diversified livestock operation in South Texas, and he's been at the helm for nearly three years. Joining me in the studio is Forrest Roberts, Chief Executive Officer of NCBA. Forrest, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back, Kevin. Well, we've been learning about the various facets of NCBA, the volunteer leaders, the staff. Tell us a little bit about this group of people. Well, it's a great group of people. They're absolutely uh, salt of the earth folks that I have the honor and the privilege of working with and representing each and every day. NCBA is the oldest and largest national cattlemen's organization in this country. And while producers are no doubt at the core of everything we do, uh, we work hard every day to connect all of those different dots up and down the whole beef supply chain here in the United States. That's what NCBA is, uh, is really all about. Well, given the size of the organization, the, the complexity of the organization, and frankly, the complexity of the industry, uh, how does staff go about figuring out what to do every day and how to organize to get that work done? Yeah, good question. It starts with a lot of hard work and uh, also a lot of focus. We tend to break down everything every day into three big areas. First, how do we grow demand for beef here domestically? And then secondly, how do we gain access to a lot of these key export markets all around the globe? And as you know, you got about 96% of the total global population that lives outside of the United States. Right. And then third is how do we build that beef business climate that gives beef producers all across this country what we refer to as freedom to operate in a responsible way. And that takes a whole lot of coordination. It takes a whole lot of engagement with uh, folks all across this industry. That's how we get the job done every day. Now, you've just finished fis fiscal year uh, 2011, is that right? That's correct. And, and, and what would be some of the things that you and the organization are most proud of? Well, this focus that I referenced earlier has all been around this question. How do we have more people enjoying beef more often? No matter what county, what state, what country they live in. And first is around some groundbreaking initiatives. We're very proud of, for one example, what we've been able to start in 2011 with what we call the Beef Sustainability Assessment. It's a major research project that really 
calculates and measures the footprint of the U.S. beef industry when we think about the environment, the economy, and the impact on rural communities. Secondly, we've been able to cut through a lot of this consumer clutter mm -hmm. and being able to position beef at the center of the plate for Americans. We've got some new data that's coming through the American Heart Association that, Kevin, it's going to change that paradigm of beef as a part of a of heart disease to beef as a part of a heart healthy mm -hmm. diet. And this business climate we talked about earlier, we've had a lot of pushback against some regulations that will have a, a very detrimental impact to the beef industry, first from EPA uh, to secondly around this proposed gypsy rule. But the thing that I think we're most proud of is that in 2011, we found ways to work together mm -hmm. with our state partners, be it the state cattlemen's groups that are part of NCBA, as well as our state beef council partners in a way that's really developed some committed partnerships across the beef industry. That's what we're really proud of. A couple of big wins. Now look forward for us and, and what are some of your priorities and goals for 2012 and beyond? Well, 2011 was all about building momentum and 2012 is all about growth. Grow starting with our organization. How do we continue to grow membership by adding more value to beef producers all across the industry? Growth in terms of the resourcing for us as staff to get the job done on behalf of beef producers each and every day. And then third is around growth of beef demand. If we do our jobs right and we look at the wholesale beef demand as one index that we measure day in and day out, we feel like we have a big opportunity for growth in beef demand, not just here domestically, but around the globe. Forrest, you and your team have a lot to be proud of and a lot of great things to look forward to. Thanks for coming to the show. You bet. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Next week, join us for a special live edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Ask the experts your questions about animal traceability. That's Tuesday, December 13th at 8.30 Eastern on RFD TV. Thanks for joining us for this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll see you back here next week on RFD TV.